um, we all know that uh, biodiversity is important, but uh, also, also equally important is we must be able to have a system by which we could annotate and uh, uh, the biodiversity we have in our particular area or country. So we all know that there are millions of species. There is a debate as to how many species there are uh, on Earth. Uh, in perpetuity, we need around 15,000 taxonomists that are required to study and describe uh, life. And most of the time, we rely on morphological diagnosis. Uh, within the last few decades, however, we have started utilizing DNA as a means to uh, identify and study and determine uh, species identification. So uh, from the local setting here in the Philippines, we have a very high biodiversity. Just by looking at the vertebrates alone, we have a very high endemicity for... So we have a very high endemicity for... Oops, sorry. We have a very high endemicity for vertebrates. Uh, uh, I may say endemic, they are found only here and nowhere else. So we have uh, uh, a very high endemicity for birds, for uh, reptiles, for fishes, amphibians, and uh, mammals, excluding humans. So we also have super endemics. Uh, these are endemic species that are found only in one particular area in the Philippines and nowhere else. And we have, much, we have many of these examples here. Uh, we also have a high abundance of diversity in plants uh, and even in corals. So I will not go into the, uh, the details of the Philippine biodiversity. So we're not going to get a barcoding. So what is DNA barcoding? Basically, we make use of a small section of the DNA of a particular individual. We sequence that, uh, we sequence a particular uh, gene region, and then we, cro we cross-reference that against the database in order to find a perfect match or the closest match by which we could identify that unknown individual. So through DNA barcoding, unknown individuals could be named or could be assigned to species. <coughs> and in fact, we have been utilizing DNA barcodes as additional metric, as additional characteristics to describe species. I'm not saying that we should substitute DNA uh, morphology with DNA, uh, which we call DNA taxonomy, but DNA also has taxonomic value. Now, across different taxa, we use different molecular markers. For example, for animals, we use uh, the cytooxidase of group 1, in addition to other markers like the 16S and the uh, nuclear small cell so RNA. It's also different for plants, for fungi, and bacteria. So, in most cases, it is usually by serendipity. Whichever is most available in the database, that's what they can use. Although we are also encouraged to view or to study other markers that may exhibit within species, or sorry, uh, that may exhibit enough variation across different species within a taxonomic group in order to discriminate one species from another. So basically, DNA barcodes or DNA sequences can act like a universal product code, uh, and through these specific sequences, we cross reference them against a database. Now, one of the earliest uh, uh, sequences that we have uh, obtained for the Philippines uh, was that of the Philippine Eagle way back in 2010. So this one is an actual COI barcode that we have submitted to a database. Now, what happens when you get a, when, when you try to come up with a COI barcode or an animal barcode or a taxon barcode for your taxon of interest? Basically, when we do DNA barcoding, we have to work hand in hand with taxonomists, okay? And we need to populate the database, okay? So that's the first, uh, most important step whenever we want to annotate our type uh, biodiversity. We must have a comprehensive database for our taxa. So normally, DNA barcoders like myself work hand in hand with taxonomists, for example, with JC. Uh, here, uh, we work on birds. So we first collect the specimens from the field or from the museums. We, we try to get what uh, we, we get what we can find from museums. The taxonomist will tell us which species is which based on morphological characteristics. And then we try to get the tissue samples from them. And then we extract the DNA and then amplify the specific region and sequence them. Now on top of these uh, molecular data, we also try to get other data points uh, so that we can have metadata analysis. So we try to obtain collection data, uh, get photographs, especially for species that are protected, and therefore we cannot just kill them 
and put them in our freezers because we have very strong uh, uh, Philippine laws uh, which run after people who just sample specimens for without uh, applying for permits. And then all these other data plus the gene sequencing analysis must be submitted into an internet accessible specimen data and DNA barcode. That's the only time DNA barcodes will be useful if they are publicly available. Now, with the advent of uh, these databases, eventually you don't even have to get the DNA from a specific individual. You just get DNA from an environmental isolate, for example, a water sample, soil sample, and you try to determine what can be found in such soil samples or what organisms have left their DNA in such samples in order for us to detect their presence. So these eDNA, okay, you just extract the DNA from these environmental isolates and then uh, you either do a DNA barcoding, you target a specific uh, taxon, for example, you you want to monitor an invasive species that must have left uh, that could have left its DNA in the soil or in the water, or a potential parasite, and then you amplify the specific uh, gene region of that species. Or if you're going blind, you don't know what is present in that particular area, you can also do DNA meta coding using next generation sequencing. It will tell you what organisms could have been present from your biological or environmental sample. Okay. So uh, DNA barcoding, if you have a comprehensive data set, can be useful for various works, for biodiversity studies, wildlife forensics, and even the monitoring of invasive species, to name a few. Now for the next few slides, I will just show you some of the works that we have done uh, that utilize DNA barcodes. So here's one. Uh, we tried to elucidate the biodiversity of this particular group of snails, the Helicostyline. Uh, these are land snails using DNA barcodes. And what we have discovered is that there are actually many cryptic species uh, that exist within this taxonomic group, which uh, the morphological features does not, do not express. Okay, so this is based on the DNA. Now, another application is, of course, wildlife forensics. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a few years ago, way back in 2013, a ship uh, a fishing vessel ran aground uh, along the Bataha Reef and then uh, later on when the ship was uh, brought to port at Puerto Princesa they uncovered these pangolins. Okay? Uh, these were dressed pangolins. Uh, the scales have already been removed because the scales were of high value, uh, especially in the Chinese market. And we had no way of knowing what species of pangolins they were. So the, uh, the fishermen who were in charge of the ship uh, they could have been potentially prosecuted for violating the Philippine Wildlife Act, okay, which prohibits the sale, capture, and uh, trading of uh, endangered species, which includes the Philippine pangolin. So in order for us to determine what kind of pangolin this is because of limited uh, morphological features that remain from these carcasses, we did molecular barcoding using specific sequences and if these are the, and this is the phylogenetic tree of uh, this particular uh, set of samples, and we uncovered that these uh, tubata uh, uh, confiscated uh, pangolins were in fact uh, related to the Manis Javanica. So these are the Indonesian pangolins. If you just imagine our collective sigh for legal, we discovered that they were not Philippine pangolins because otherwise uh, we would have been uh, tapped to present ourselves as expert witness in, uh, in court. And at that time, we did not have existing protocols uh, uh, as ex uh, to, pro uh, to process samples that should be presented as evidence. Okay? But after that experience, we had to follow strict protocols uh, when handling cases, uh, evidence. Okay? And then another one is uh, another application of DNA barcode is, of course, for monitoring invasive species. Uh, one uh, such uh, group of invasive species are those that are uh, carried by uh, water ballast uh, in ships. As you all know, major uh, ocean-going cargoes, they have water ballast, which they obtain water from their original port, and then they unload the water in, their, uh, uh, in the next port. And sometimes they may uh, bring with them some species from the original port to these new sites, and thereby uh, serving as major source of bioinvasions. 
So in one of our studies, we tried to survey uh, potential invasive species in Manila Bay, and we discovered that there's actually this particular species, Metella charwana, which very much resembles some of our native uh, bivalves or mussels. But when we tried to look at their morphology as well as their molecular, uh, as well as their DNA particles, we, we discovered that they're actually uh, present in Manila Bay. They're originally from South America, okay? Uh, they are edible in South America. They have yet to be uh, uh, introduced, and they have to be uh, the concept of these uh, snake, uh, these uh, bivalves being uh, uh, consumable for many Filipinos is still a, a foreign concept because they think of these as fowling organisms. Okay. Now, um, going to annotation, uh, there is a, a consortium called the Consortium for the Barcode of Life, which is now called IBOL, the International Barcode of Life, which was launched way back in 2004, and it includes more than 120 organi organizations for the five countries. So it now includes the Philippines. Now, this organization fosters the development of the international research alliances needed to build over the next 20 years, so by 2024, uh, a barcode library of all eukaryotic life. Okay, so they were very optimistic way back then, 2004, 2004, that they should have barcoded every eukaryotic species on Earth. And this uh, seaball, uh, or eyeball now, as we call it, is the host of the bone system. Now the bone system is also as the barcode of life data system. It's an informatics workbench, uh, which aids in acquisition, storage, analysis, and publication of DNA barcode records. So this uh, database, uh, 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 bridges a traditional uh, bioinformatics cast somewhere. You have the molecular data on the one hand and all the other data associated to every specimen on the other. So now we have a platform that combines all these. Now why is that? This is because every time you submit a DNA barcode to Bo, you have to provide also the following data points. What was the specimen name, the species name, volume data, uh, for example, the cattle number and then institution storage uh, facility, where it is stored. Uh, collection record, who collected it, uh, when was it collected, um, uh, uh, the place uh, it was collected, and preferably GPS coordinates. Who identified the specimen, and then the sequence uh, of the barcode, whether it's a COI or other marker. And then uh, the primers utilized to amplify the sequence as well as the raw data, the trace files. Okay? So all of these must be present in your, uh, uh, in your uh, submissions. So the bone core data will include the specimen data, even specimen images for cross-referencing and uh, future uh, evaluation or review, the actual sequences and the trace files. And sometimes each client may even provide uh, custom fields to provide further information or data points for every specimen collected uh, or submitted. Now here's an example of what we have submitted. It's a, a land snail, we saw the Zeus, uh, which includes all the information uh, pertaining to this particular specimen. Uh, it also includes the map where it is located and the actual barcode. Okay. Now the barcode here is a particular representation of the sequence. So every color there, uh, every vertical line represents a nucleotide. So that's a particular representation of the barcode. Now with this information, you can actually utilize both for various researchers. For example, for phylogenetic analysis, biogeographic uh, uh, species distribution, um, uh, species area curves, etc. So this is a useful platform. Uh, aside from annotating your biodiversity. And one of the most important points of uh, DNA barcoding is to determine really uh, how much variation <coughs> exists within species and between species. Now this is very important because you want to establish a threshold value, okay? Now what is a threshold value? A threshold value is something you utilize, for example, if you have an unknown individual, you get its COI barcode, and then you try to look at its closest match, and it says there, based on the results, it's 97% identical to Homo sapiens, for example. So what does that mean? Is it indeed Homo sapiens, or is it not Homo sapiens? So the difference 
we have to establish a threshold value so that when we so that we will know the inclusion when to include a species within that a sample within that uh, species or taxonomic group or when to exclude them. So in many instances we use a threshold value wherein oops wherein uh, you have here the maximum <coughs> interspecific distance should not overlap with the minimum interspecific distance or difference. Okay? And with that, you establish a threshold value. Now, when that happens, okay, uh, you use the threshold value for your species identification. Okay? Now, sometimes, however, at least not sometimes, is most of the time there are overlaps. Okay? Wherein the interspecific distance actually is greater than the interspecific uh, difference. So when that happens, those taxa that fall within uh, that overlap, uh, their identification can be very, very problematic. And therefore, it's important for us to come up with as comprehensive a uh, data set as possible in order to identify these problematic taxa and try to figure out why there is an overlap. Is it because of wrong taxonomy? Is it because of cross-contamination in the lab, and that happens a lot. And in many databases like Genpa, uh, these, contra these uh, contaminations do exist, or these submissions, wrong submissions, do exist. And that, uh, uh, as a, on a personal note, it also happens to me on one occasion. I tried to extract DNA from snails, and when I looked at the barcodes, it did not make sense. It was only after several days later of analyzing, my supervisor suggested, have you tried to cross-reference that to the database? And when I did, it's 99.9% .9 homo sapiens. So obviously it came from me when I was extracting <laughs> DNA. Because at that time, when I was doing my PhD, I was, my hair follicles were already starting to fall. <laughs> so I probably inadvertently extracted DNA from my own hair follicle. So where a hair is. <laughs> so when this happens, you may suffer from false positives, uh, wherein you identify spurious novel taxa, uh, when you split them into different species, especially when the interspecific uh, variation extends deeper than the threshold value. Or you can suffer from false negatives, wherein you lump together two distinct species as one. So we, we have to constantly evaluate our taxa. And this is a problem because when we identify species, we base it on morphology, and on the other hand, we have this uh, DNA-based taxonomy. So one way to address this issue is to come up with a mechanism to describe or to uh, uh, reconcile the differences between classical taxonomy and DNA taxonomy. Okay? So here's an example. Uh, as March 20, 2019, there are 9.382 million specimen records with 6.547 specimens with barcodes from 291,000 species. That's still small. Uh, based on our estimate of millions of species available. Okay? So, uh, Bold came up with an alternative called BINS. This is what you call the barcode index number system. It's an online framework that clusters barcode sequences algorithmically. So they use a clustering algorithm that clusters together all these barcodes into the most similar types depending on the threshold value and then they generate a web page for each barcode, uh, uh, barcode number, so bin. So each bin is supposed to include as many samples or specimens as possible that is very, very similar to one another. And in most cases, not all, usually it shows high concordance with species identification and can also be used to, uh, to verify species identifications. So here's an example of three web pages. Uh, each represents a bin and each represents uh, uh, individuals uh, which can be ascribed to that particular number, okay? Now, what happens when you look at bits and compare them to species identification? Sometimes, there is a match. A species can be ascribed to a particular bin, but in other times, you have a species that actually split into two different bins, okay? Is it possible that you have cryptic species? And then uh, there are other instances where you have two distinct species, but they actually merge into just one bin. Is it an example of wrong taxonomy? You have two different species independently identified based on different samples, but in fact they're actually the same species. And then you have a mixture of any of these. Now, 
what could be the reason for these incongruences? Could be lab issues, cross contamination, plate flips, taxonomic issues like misidentification and uh, synonymy, or it could also be biological. For example, the presence of cryptic species. What are cryptic species? These are species that resemble each other superficially but are in fact very different species. Or it could be a result of young species. They are still, they have not completely diverged. Or introgression, or even hybridization. Okay. Now, just to give you some idea of what, uh, how much data we have for the Philippines, uh, because uh, that's what I have access to. For the barcode count, we have 27,639 sequences. That's very small compared to uh, 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 in considering that the Philippines has a, is a very high. Uh, has a very high biodiversity and it's in fact a biodiversity hotspot. We have, uh, they are linked to 3,586 named spe species, but with 4,772 bins. We have actually more bins than actual species. Okay, So there are taxonomic implications of these. So in terms of species coverage, majority of the, uh, of the data come from the vertebrates. bins. And as I mentioned, uh, and as mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Aneta a while ago, the invertebrates uh, comprise nearly 97% of the animal kingdom. So there's clearly strong bias towards the invertebrates. And then, uh, and then we have here the bin coverage. So there is a proposition to use bins rather than uh, uh, species names because if there are millions upon millions of species, does it make sense to give a name for every species? Does it make sense to give a name to every star in the universe, so to speak, or, or uh, uh, give a name to every, gra uh, every grain of sand on the seashore? But of course, on the, uh, the, on the one hand, it has its practical value. On the other hand, it becomes, uh, uh, how should I put it, uh, cold and uh, it loses its connection with its taxonomies. For example, what is your species? What is the species designation of this taxon? Oh, it's species one four six five. What does that mean? It, uh, it only makes sense to the to the the algorithm, the, the one who developed the algorithm, but to the main person it does not make sense. Okay, so these are the things that we have to consider if we want to adapt bins instead of species names. Okay, so. To summarize, DNA barcodes are informative. We can derive information from them. DNA barcodes must be database, cataloged, and annotated to get a picture of global biodiversity. And the Philippines and the ASEAN also must actively annotate this biodiversity, particularly in the ASEAN region. We are a center, regional, regional center of biodiversity. So thank you very much.